You know, we live in a very divided, polarizing world. Uh, today, maybe more than ever, the call for us to be united in love has great significance and maybe greater significance than ever. The isolation of living through these COVID times has certainly made the need for relationship uh, very relevant to us and very important to us, hasn't it? We need to be encouraging, building one another up, and the world needs to see the love of Jesus Christ in and through us as a united people. And so with these uh, simple thoughts in mind, I'd like to share a two-part mini-series with you, if, if the Lord wills, as we continue this week and next in, in a series I've just entitled Cultivating Unity Through Character and Conduct. And I'd like to share uh, some thoughts from Ephesians chapter 4. So if you could please turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. Our scripture reading will be from the first 16 verses. And we pray that the Lord will bless the reading of his word to us as he already has this morning. The Apostle Paul continues in this letter written to the church at Ephesus. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, the Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. By grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for the opportunity, the privilege, the freedom to be here today and to publicly open your word and consider its truths together. As we do so, we invite, we desire, we, we need the Holy Spirit to move and work in our hearts and our minds. Father, we'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory as we seek your help now in Jesus' name. Amen. Many Bible scholars at Shoreacres Bible Chapel, I know for sure, uh, the first three chapters of Ephesians, Paul articulates our standing in Christ. And if we go back to Ephesians chapter 1, we're reminded that we've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ. And there Paul outlines for us that those of us who by faith has received Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, we've been forgiven, we've been redeemed, we've been adopted, we've been predestined, we've been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And what a wonderful privilege that is. What a wonderful standing that is. What a wonderful position we have in Christ. And as he comes now to chapter 4, this is transition that says, okay, in light of that calling, in light of, of all of that blessing, he says, I want you to walk worthy of the calling with which you've been called. And a worthy walk is one that is concerned with and, in fact, cultivates loving, united relationships with one another and how significant and key that is. Is. And this has been certainly paramount in a lot of our hearts and our minds when for so long, over the last couple of years, we couldn't get together. We couldn't connect as we normally uh, like to and want to and desire to. Uh, and so now we, we just focus on these truths and consider the question this morning, how do we cultivate unity? Well, first of all, notice that we cultivate and establish unity through our ongoing pursuit of godly character. And the Apostle Paul begins chapter 4 by saying this, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you've been called. I urge you. Now think about this. The Apostle Paul is a prisoner. He's in jail. He's about to die. 
And he says, I urge you, I have an urgent message for you. Well, what do you think that urgent message would be? I remember working years ago when I was started out at the school I, I just retired from 35 years ago as a guidance counselor and had a young man who was serving time in prison on weekends. And he would come to me, I remember, on, on a Friday after school before he had to sort of enter jail for the weekend. And he said, Mr. Ward, whatever you can do, just find a way, call the judge, talk to my probation officer, do, get me out of here. This is horrible. And we expect here maybe the Apostle Paul to be focused on his own needs, his own concerns, his own desires here. It's an urgent message from prison, but it's not about him. It's not about his circumstance. It's not about his needs. It's about other people. It's about the church of Jesus Christ. It's about his love for others. And he says, I, I urge you. The, the New Living Translation says, I beg you. The New American Standard says, I implore you. And I implore implore you or I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. As we read on, we discover that the worthy walk is collectively defined by nurturing relationships and unity, which is first of all produced through character, through character. And before we get specific about the kind of character Paul is talking about here that is so significant and needed to create and maintain unity, we realize that that this, this desire, this pursuit is motivated, notice what we read here in verse 3, by an eagerness to maintain unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. We are to be eager as Christians. We are to be zealous. It actually means we are to be in a hurry to unite together in love. We need one another. That's the bottom line here. Paul knew that. He had people attending to his needs even while in prison, and he was so grateful for them. We need one another, and the world needs to see us united in Christ in love. And in these turbulent, divisive, polarizing times in which we live, when people see the love of Christ in you and me, when they see that in our unity one with another, there will be questions asked. Hey, what, what are you all about? What do you believe? What is going on in this world? Where is this world headed? I've been answering those questions more so than usual the last couple of years. Does this eagerness describe you? Does it describe me? Well, Paul doesn't begin with, with conduct with respect to how this happens, this unity happens, but rather he begins with the need to cultivate godly character. And so we look at our passage and find the first character trait required to cultivate unity is humility humility. What does it mean to be humble? And why is this the first character trait mentioned? Well, first of all, the word humility refers to a lowliness of mind. And in the context of relationships, this means that someone who is humble thinks more about others and less about themselves. One scholar uh, said this, humility is not thinking less of yourself, it is thinking of yourself less. <laughs> that's, that's pretty good, right? That's pretty good. You know, I've been reading through and, and doing some, some speaking over these last weeks and months on the, on the Sermon on the Mount. I, I think this is just a personal perspective. I think every church should spend some time throughout the calendar year in the Sermon on the Mount. Just whatever it might be, a week, a two, a three, whatever. Right? As we come back and consider the greatest sermon of all time preached by the greatest preacher and teacher of all time. And where does Jesus, the greatest teacher of all time, begin the greatest sermon of all time? He begins with character. And he begins with humility. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. The word means the humble. Our world says <clears throat> you want to be blessed or successful and get ahead. You need to be proud. You need to be confident. You almost need to be arrogant in spirit. And Jesus says, no, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn their impoverished spiritual state. Blessed are the meek. I uh, just happened to have an NIV Bible concordance beside my desk when I was preparing this message, and so I just picked it up, and the old-fashioned way uh, counted, physically counted, the number of times the word humble or a, a form of it, a tense of it, uh, appears in the NIV translation. You know how many times? Exactly 100 times. <laughs> I 
You know, as a coach, as a phys ed teacher, as a parent, as a grandparent, I know there are times when I have said, I've told you a hundred times, and I know I'm wrong. It might have been once or twice, right? <laughs> uh, no, the good Lord said 100 times, be humble. Talks with the significance of humility. Micah 6.8 says, what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? Being humble is the root of our topic of unity. I came across this illustration, uh, which comes from the world of sports. Chan Gailey, football coach of the Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets, told how he learned a lesson in humility. Now, this comes from 2004. Um, he has since gone on to leave this school and actually coached in the professional ranks, but this is about Chan Gailey. Gailey was the head coach of Alabama's Troy State at the time, and they were playing for a national championship. The week before the big game, he was headed to the practice field when a secretary called him back to take a phone call. Somewhat irritated, Gailey told her to take a message because he was on his way to practice. She responded, Coach, but it's Sports Illustrated calling. Oh, I'll be right there, he said. As he made his way to the building, he began to think about the upcoming article. It would be great publicity for a small school like Troy State to be in Sports Illustrated. As he got closer, he realized that a three-page article would not be sufficient to tell the whole story. Coming even closer to his office, he started thinking that he might, might actually be on the cover. Should I pose or, or go with an action shot, he wondered. His head was spinning with all the possibilities. <laughs> when he picked up the phone and said hello, the person asked, Is this Coach Chan Gailey? Well, yes it is, he replied confidently. This is Sports Illustrated. And we're calling to let you know that your subscription is running out. Are you interested in renewing? <laughs> Coach Gailey concluded the story by saying, as the scripture says, you are either humble or you will be humbled. When it comes to cultivating relationships, it's no surprise that humility is the first character trait mentioned. And as we sort of get into this study, uh, which we need to progress quickly through, the question becomes, how do we change character? How do we do that? You know, some people say, I've said it myself, look, my dear wife, who we've been married, I have to do the math, 36-ish years, <laughs> long time. That's just the way I am. <laughs> that is such a cop-out. <laughs> that is such a cop-out. As a Christian, as somebody who's been born again of the Spirit of the God, I have the ability to change. And God wants to change me. How do we change? Well, we can change by surrounding ourselves with wonderful human examples of humble people. It's a good thing. They're hard to find. But read about them. Study them. See who God has used over the centuries. So many wonderful, humble people, biographies to study, to think about. And those who we currently know and love to interact with. Surround yourself with humble people. I, I just recently read, uh, last week I was reading in a book, and a, a young pastor over in, in Britain talked about his mentor. And he was a man who preached to hundreds and influenced thousands of people around the world. And he retired in his 80s, and they retired to a small little village in England. And out in the rural country, this little church in town, uh, they wanted, the women wanted to start a little Bible study for, for moms, but there was nobody to look after the toddlers. So this man in his mid-80s, this man who had influenced people around the world for, for decades, volunteered. And until the day he died, he spent every week with a room full of toddlers so that moms could have a Bible study. That's humility, friends. We need to surround ourselves with humble people, don't we? But of course, having said that, there's no greater example, is there, than the perfect example of humility, our very own Lord Jesus Christ. And so we ask ourselves the question, we'll ask it a number of times in the next few minutes we have together. Not what would Jesus do? I, this is a thing with me. I, I, it's been 20 years almost since I was last here. <laughs> and I maybe didn't bring it up then. And if I did, you might have forgotten. <laughs> it's possible. 
But if I were to start a new, you know, kind of jewelry line or clothing line, it wouldn't be WWJD, what would Jesus do? That's the wrong question to me, right? Because it suggests ambiguity, uncertainty. No, the, the, the question is, what did Jesus do? Because we know. We have the word of God in our hands. We have his life, his words, his conduct, his character. It's here for us to read and to study. So the question isn't, what would Jesus do? It's, what did Jesus do? W D, J, whatever, right? You get the idea. So what did Jesus do? Well, friends, we know that Philippians 2, 8 tells us he humbled himself, became obedient to death, even death on a cross. And as we've considered this morning, the Lord Jesus Christ came to this earth and humbly died on the cross. We thank you what we read earlier from, from the scriptures, how he was falsely accused and arrested and, and beaten and flogged and eventually died on a cross the very son of God to save a wretch like me oh we thank him this morning don't we have you come to the foot of the cross I don't know who's listening I don't know who's tuned in I don't know everybody here have you come to the foot of the cross and looked up at the very son of God the greatest example of humility there is dying on a cross to save you to making a way of salvation possible for you? Have you come to the foot of the cross? Have you, have you exercised faith in the person of Jesus Christ and through faith and belief in what he accomplished? Your sins have been forgiven. Your relationship with God restored. The hope of eternal life. I hope it's in your heart. And if not, then that can be your experience today. True character change begins when we are born again of the Spirit of God. I can no longer say, honey, that's just the way I am. Because I have an example here, a perfect example here of Jesus Christ that I can learn from. And as we seek to grow and become more like him, we need to keep Hebrews 12, 2 constantly before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So as we continue to look at a couple more character traits that Paul said are so key to unity, to loving one another, we need to keep Jesus ever before us as the perfect example. And ask ourselves that question, what did Jesus do? Well, let's see. Secondly, along with humility, Paul says we need to be gentle. Gentleness. We need to be gentle people. William MacDonald writes, gentleness is the attitude that submits to God's dealings without rebellion and to man's unkindness without retaliation. It is best seen in the life of him who said, I am gentle and lowly in heart. To be gentle means to be kind, amiable, not harsh, not rough, not violent. Older translations use the word meek in this verse, which again takes us back to the Sermon on the Mount. Many associate meekness with weakness, and yet to be gentle and meek is to have great spiritual strength and character. In order to cultivate relationships and maintain unity, we need to equip ourselves with the characteristic of gentleness. Gentleness. What did Jesus do? Not what would he do, because it kind of says, I'm not sure. No, we know. What, what did Jesus do? Take a look at John chapter 8, that amazing passage, right, where this woman was brought before him, caught in a sin. And as these people who wanted to condemn her had rocks in their hands ready to stone her because that's what the law called for. What did the gentle Savior say? Neither do I condemn you. Go. And from now on, sin no more. You know, do we go throughout the day, figuratively speaking, with rocks in our hands? looking for opportunities to condemn other people. We live in that kind of world. Just turn on your TVs. All you hear are rocks being thrown. All you see are rocks being thrown. Sometimes, unfortunately, physically. But so often we, we live in such a divisive, polarizing world where we're just seeking to, to condemn other people and condemn opinion and all the rest of it. It's so divisive, isn't it? No, we are to be humble. We as Christians, as those who have exercised faith, in God, we are to be gentle. Our hearts are to be ready to show compassion, ready to pursue unity over division. Thirdly, the worthy walk which cultivates unity through character includes patience. Ooh, this is getting tough now, isn't it? We need to be humble. 
We need to be gentle. But here Paul says we need to be patient. And patience is defined as the, in the following way. The ability to accept calmly things that trouble or annoy us. Oof. What annoys you? What annoys me? Well, since I'm up front, I got to be honest first, don't I? What annoys me? <laughs> so I live, we live now in the Halton Hills. We kind of had some homes in Mississauga over the years as needs change, houses needs change, but now we were kind of retired up to the Halton Hills. We've been there for about five years. We love it up there, up, sort of on the edge of the country. And uh, I live, I live in an office that's maybe 12 feet by 10 feet, we'll say. That's where I live, right? That's where I spend all my time. That's where I study and prepare messages. Um, that's where the house is run from. The bills are paid from there, right? And so that's just kind of my little world. They let me out from time to time, but that's basically where I live. When people come into that office and start messing around in there, like grandkids, like adult children who should know better, and they mess my stuff up, and that annoys me. You, you just can't do that. That's, that's my world in there. And Paul says, Dale, you need to be humble. You need to be gentle. You need to be patient. You need to accept calmly things that trouble or annoy you. We live in a very me-centered society, that's, and there seems to be a growing list of things that annoy us. And as this list increases and impatience persists, our relationships continue to deteriorate. I grew up in Toronto in a small, I want to call it maybe 1,100 square foot bungalow house. There was one bathroom. There were three kids, mom and dad, three kids. I shared a bedroom with my older brother till I was 18. Some of you know my older brother, some of you might, you, that might explain for some of the issues I've got in life, but anyway. You look back on it, one car, one telephone. One. It's changed, hasn't it? We all need our own rooms. We all need our own en-suites. We all need our own sinks in that en-suite. We, we, we don't sort of want to get into each other's airspace, do we? Paul says you need to be patient. And if we agree that relationships are incredibly important to our well-being and highly valued by God, then we need to turn the tide and seek to cultivate relationships rather than destroy them through a lack of patience. The, the worthy walk of the Christian life is described in terms of relationship and unity. Therefore, the quality of our relationships with one another should be a priority in our lives. What is the quality of the relationships in your life and in my life? Are they being lovingly cultivated or are they, are they being hurt through a lack of of patience, again, patience, the ability to accept calmly the things that annoy us. I remember, it just came to my, my head, thinking back to all those years when I, I first came here as a young guy, no gray hair, two little kids at the time, a third on the way, and they loved, of course, to play in the backyard. Well, I have this thing every year, I like my lawn to be nice, right? And I have a, I have a I'm a little competitive, I admit it, and I have this silent competition with all my neighbors that I'm going to have the nicest lawn on the street. They don't know about the competition. It's just something I have going on in my little head. Right? And so when those little kids, I remember the, they're out there, they're having a great time, and what are they doing? They're tearing up my lawn. <laughs> I got a little impatient. Sue, do, do we really need, do they really need to destroy the entire lawn? I still remember what she said to me. Dale? Are we raising kids or are we raising grass? Uh, right, 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 good question. We need to be patient, don't we? What did Jesus do? What did Jesus do? In Mark 10, 45, we read, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. The scriptures teach that the worthy walk is characterized by an eagerness. We need to be in a hurry to maintain unity. This happens as we seek to cultivate relationships through character that is humble, gentle, patient. And fourthly, we need to, we read, bear with one another in love. Older translations say we are to demonstrate forbearance with one another in love. 
forbearance, an old word. But forbearance suggests, get this now, this even gets harder, uncommon patience, and so we just talked about what patience was, to forbear is, is, is uncommon patience and self-control and keeping oneself from doing or saying something when greatly tried or provoked. <laughs> hmm. Forbearance suggests uncommon patience and self-control and keeping oneself from doing or saying something when greatly tried or provoked. This is, this is a character trait that's a little further along the continuum from patience. By definition, it is uncommon patience that allows us the ability to control our words, our actions, when being directly provoked. I have a huge admiration for elementary school teachers. I don't know if there's any here, any retired ones here. Um, I'm sure there are, I know there are. And your job is just um, an incredible one. And I came across this illustration that you can identify with. Did you hear the Texas tall tale about the teacher who was helping one of her kindergarten students put on his cowboy boots? He asked for help and she could see why. Even with her pulling and him pushing, the little boots still didn't want to go on. By the time they got the second boot on, she had worked up a sweat. And she almost cried when the little boy said, teacher, they're on the wrong feet. She looked and sure enough they were. It wasn't any easier pulling the boots off than it was putting them on. She managed to keep her cool. This is forbearance, friends. Her cool as together they worked to get the boots back on, this time on the right feet. He then announced, these aren't my boots. She bit her tongue rather than get right in his face and scream, why didn't you say so? Forbearance. Once again, she struggled to help him pull the ill-fitting boots off his little feet. No sooner had they gotten the boots off when he said, they're my brother's boots. My mom made me wear them today. <laughs> now she didn't know she should laugh or cry, but she mustered up what grace and courage and forbearance, I'm adding in, she had left to wrestle the boots off his little feet again. Helping him into his coat, she asked, now where are your mittens? He said, I stuffed them into the toes of my boots. <laughs> <laughs> forbearance. Forbearance, right? It, 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 it is... It is uncommon patience. And I look at my own life and I, I struggle to be patient. I really do. Uh, even though I'm retired, I had a whistle in my hand in a gym for 35 years. And from time to time, Sue will have to remind me at home, even with the adult children or with the grand, Dale, put, put the whistle away. All right? Put, put the whistle away. Be patient. Forbear, as Paul encourages us to do. Well, how do we go about cultivating forbearance into our character. Well, it requires a paradigm shift for me. Instead of reacting or retaliating to a perceived provocation, we need to pause and calmly assess the situation and circumstances. We need to be quick to assume the best in someone, particularly a friend, rather than the worst. Often we overreact with words or actions that are based on inaccurate information or inaccurate assumption of what someone's intentions really are. I, we want to determine motive all the time, don't we? No, we can't do that. Only the good Lord knows motive. We need to assume the best in one another. And if we want to walk worthy to the calling of the calling to which we've been called, then we need to bear with one another in love. Let's assume the best in each other. Let's seek the positive in others rather than focusing on the negative. And I won't speak for you, but I know that I am certainly far, far from perfect. Ruth Graham Bell said the following, wrote the following, I saw a sign on a strip of highway once that I would like to have copied on my gravestone. It said, end of construction, thank you for your patience. <laughs> W-D-J-D, what, what did Jesus do? Jesus demonstrated the greatest example of forbearance in Luke 23, 33, 34, we read this, and when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, what did he say? Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Then they cast lots to divide his garments. Father, Forgive them, 
They don't know what they're doing. The bottom line is that we need one another. The worthy walk is defined in terms of relationship, and as Christians, the Apostle Paul says we should be eager to maintain unity, be in a hurry to maintain unity. This will happen and be a result if we cultivate relationships through character and conduct. Specifically, let's be encouraged to continue to pursue the character traits of humility, gentleness, patience, and forbearance. And let me just close, if I can, just two more minutes with uh, one final just illustration. This isn't always the case. I've brought a couple of illustrations today from Sports Illustrated, which is kind of interesting because you wouldn't expect these kind of stories to appear in Sports Illustrated, but this uh, story sort of uh, captures what we've been talking about this morning, and it comes from uh, July the 6th, 2009. Bob Smeens lives on the hillside overlooking Iowa's other field of dreams. On Friday nights in the fall, Smeens has always liked to sit on his back deck and watch the uh, Parkersburg High School Falcons football team play. The rest of the year, he liked to sit on his deck and watch a legend tend to the grass. Now we're bringing up grass again. <laughs> It's being called the carpet, the sacred acre, and officially Ed Thomas Field, after the 58-year-old coach who laid down the sod. Thomas walked that field every morning, yanking weeds, killing dandelions, fertilizing the soil, kneeling down to study blades of grass for dreaded brown spots, the surest sign of chemical imbalance. Before the school installed sprinklers, Thomas carried a hose. After the school hired custodians for the field, Thomas still insisted on mowing it himself. Parkersburg is a place where an upstanding person is usually described as a good Christian. Again, this is Sports Illustrated. We're reading this out of not a missions magazine. You know, it's kind of interesting. Parkersburg is a place where an un un upstanding person is usually described as a good Christian and an out-of-towner is asked in the most casual, loving way possible, uh, what, what religion do you practice? <laughs> Thomas delivered sermons when ministers were away. He consoled husbands whose wives were ill. He presented baby boys with future Falcons certificates. <laughs> he taught kids to play football, sure, but he also taught driver's ed, making his students learn behind the wheel of a John Deere Moore before he gave them keys to a car. He worked every day but Christmas. In 37 seasons, he won 292 games. Thomas won two state titles and coached four current National Football League players, which is stunning when you consider that there are only 1,900 people in all of Parkersburg, everyone in town, it seems, played for Thomas or was a relative for somebody who did. He was the rock that this community was built on. Thomas did his last piece of, coach, last piece of coaching at 7.45 a.m. on June 24, overseeing a morning weightlifting session for about 20 students, most of them freshmen and sophomore football players, but also a few members of the girls' volleyball team. Thomas stood next to Brandon Simpkins, a promising running back and defensive back who uh, will be a sophomore next season and might, Thomas thought, make the varsity team. Brandon reported to Thomas that he had bench pressed 265 pounds, which entitled him to a coveted Falcon Power T-shirt. As they talked, Brandon said he'd seen Mark Becker stumble into the weight room in a dark blue jumpsuit that made him look sort of like a construction worker. Becker had come to lift before, so Brandon thought nothing of it. Suddenly, Becker reached into his jumpsuit, grabbed a gun, and pointed it in the direction of Brandon and Coach Thomas. Brandon had no idea whether the gun was aimed at him or his coach. He took a step back, closed his eyes, and dropped his head. Brandon heard a loud bang, which sounded like a heavy barbell plate being dropped. Then his eyes opened and saw his coach, the one he had dreamed playing for, falling to the ground. Parkersburg yearns to understand why anybody would, wanted, would have wanted to kill its most beloved citizen. He was our icon, said Barber Tom Teeple. The people of Parkersburg will remind you that being a good Christian, this is Sports Illustrated, <laughs> that being a good Christian means being able to forgive and it requires tremendous character to forgive and to unite even under these kind of circumstances. Forgive and unite with the family of an accused killer. Two days after the shooting, Joan Becker, this is the mom of the kid who did this, got out of her car in front of the Thomas's house and by the time she reached the stoop, she was weeping. The door opened and she was welcomed inside. We need to pray for the Beckers too said Todd Thomas, 28 years old, the younger son of the coach. 
they need just as much love and support as we do. Do you see the character coming out here of these people? While the Beckers may be judged outside Parkersburg, within its borders they are portrayed as a model family that did everything possible to help a wayward son. Mary Schwen said she plans to cook meals for the Beckers in addition to the Thomases. We don't blame them for this at all, said Parkersburg Superintendent John Thompson. We send them nothing but our best. I know it might seem strange, all the support they're getting here, but that's just what we do. It just feels right to us. You know, when I see a community of Christian people uniting after a horrific situation like that, and I think about the things that we can so easily divide about, I think, wow, Dale, Paul urges you to walk worthy of the calling with which you've been called. Eagerly pursue unity. Hurry after it. And it begins with character. Dale, you need to be humble. You need to be gentle. You need to be patient. You need to forbear with one another in love. And I hope that encourages your heart this morning. We need one another. It's so great to be back at Shore Acres Bible Chapel. It's been 19 years. And it's so good to be with you. And uh, it's been a long time, but I trust the Lord will just bless you and continue to pour into your lives. And I look forward with this help to be back next week. And we'll pick up this study and think about the next part of this passage, which gets into the conduct side of it, the gifts we've been given to, to support, to build up one another. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your love. Uh, we just ask a special blessing upon each individual, each couple, each family that's represented here. And uh, Father, we just pray that you'll be with us in the, the day that is ahead and the week that is ahead. Protect us, provide for us. Help us to become more and more like your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, help each one of us just to be humble, patient, um, gentle, forbearing people. And help us to eagerly desire to unite together. And Father, as we enjoy one another, we'll just be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. And we thank you for the greatest example there has ever been, the person of your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for him and for your love in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for coming.